Okay, okay. That's all for this video. It's slightly misleading. Yes, technically a mobile game did help destroy this Kickstarter, but it's actually a lot worse than that. This video game also helped destroy an Indiegogo. It was partly responsible for the disappointed aftercare of three other crowdfunded campaigns. It helped in the loss of an ungodly amount of money from private investors. It riled up social media circles of its taboo nature. And worst of all, it destroyed the lives of possibly 500 families too. And I know what you're thinking, but no, Peter Molyneux wasn't involved. Welcome to Kick Scammers, the show where I, DJ Slope, with the help of my Kick Scammer detective agency on Discord, find the absolute worst Kickstarters, Indiegogos, and GoFundMe scams, and relay all of that information back to you in a nice, shockumentary like package. And today, I can't really give you too many more details, as it will give away the story of the video game that destroyed the Kickstarter. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. But before going ahead, I just want to say a massive thank you to all of you. I've been pushing really hard lately to create some really interesting content over the last couple of months, and as much as I love doing it, to put it simply, YouTube just simply isn't promoting it. This is why it's important to hit that subscribe button and the bell if you like this sort of content. It's the absolute best way to support the channel as it pushes out my content to like-minded people. Regardless, a big thank you to all of you guys, however you decide to support the channel. And also a big thanks goes out to this video sponsor, Skillshare, the online learning platform that's offering all of you awesome people one month for free for the first 1,000 people to click the link below. If you're like me, the Sony Vegas video editing masterclass still teaches me things about the program that I had absolutely no idea about and of course for the professionals you got more Premiere and After Effects tutorials than you could ever need. And obviously it's not all about the videos themselves, it's about social media. If you want your content to be seen then you need to not only get on these platforms but you also need to master them. It's a service specifically curated for learning meaning that you get no ads, a service that's always launching new classes and best of all it's it's free for the first month for the first 1,000 people to use that link below. And if you're a creative person like me and you want to make new content, starting that YouTube channel, that art project, getting better on social media or literally anything else, then Skillshare is definitely the best way to do it. Start exploring your creativity today. Our story starts with two best friends, Lai Gang and Gao Jiayang. Gao Jiayang. Gao Jiayang, after a few not so successful business attempts, the duo decided to team up and create, manufacture, ship over 5 million units, and then sell a company that made a button that controls Android based mobile phones. And as soon as they finished with that, they looked at what they could do next. With the two both being keen cyclists, they started working on an app similar to Strava called Beast Bikes. This would eventually change to SpeedX, and then after that, they they even created some hardware too, the Speed Force, which was an Indiegogo campaign that raised $463,900 from 2,652 backers. As seen in the campaign video, this was the perfect blend of everything they had learned up to this point, blending the one-click Android button with all of the features that cyclists would want from an application like Strava, but for the time. This was a keen cyclist enthusiast's wet dream that was eventually released to some of the backers and the reviews came in average at best. There's no point getting into the nitty gritty regarding this campaign. All you need to know is that for the most part, some if not all of the features just simply did not work for quite a few people. For those that did, it was a great piece of kit, but like I said, this isn't the important part of this story because we have plenty more failures to get through. Starting with something that came in only one year later, the second campaign, the Speed X Leopard. This time, they advanced the original idea even further, from the smartphone button, to the smartphone app, to the smartphone hardware that goes onto the bike, to 
an all-in-one smart bike. If you wanted a bike that ticked all of the boxes, then this one is for you. Not only does it have the smart attachment, but on top of that, you get everything else too. A lightweight carbon fiber design, no wires whatsoever to reduce wind speed, apparently, and a body so durable that you could probably lift a Lamborghini with it. <laughs> what? You don't believe me? Watch this. Yeah. This is what at least some of the money was being spent on. Stupid little vanity projects like this. Regardless, the worst is still yet to come, so let's continue. Even if you had a passing interest in cycling, this bad boy was getting shown to you, thanks in no small part due to some rather heavy advertisements on social media. This resulted in the campaign gaining over $3 million and a further $2 million on Kickstarter for the same campaign. There was no denying that this campaign was super impressive, a bike so advanced that even if you wasn't into cycling, you were drawn in by its super sleek design and really quite incredible technology. Everything had moved so fast for the company by this point that by 2016, when both of these campaigns had finished up, the campaign now had to manufacture them in only two months, an absurd time frame that the campaigns themselves had promised. Look, credit where credit is due. Marketing a successful campaign like this is no easy feat, but it's a completely different ball game to then go out and manufacture thousands and thousands of the buggers. Month after month, backers would receive crappy excuses saying that the bikes are so, so, so close to being delivered, but in the end, it ended up taking a whole year for the units to mostly be shipped out. And let me tell you guys, the wait was the least of these backers' problems. Reviews came in scathing the bike, saying that it's simply terrible, one out of five stars pretty much all round, the tech did not work as promised, the wheels flexed, and other bad things that cyclists don't like. The only real benefit to the bike was the frame itself. If you wanted a decent bike, then all you would need to do is buy this, and then completely upgrade everything else besides the frame. So what next? The company had a stupid amount of money from the Kickstarter. They had outside money from pre-orders and supposedly they had way more than both of those things combined from private investors. The obvious thing is to fix the technology and advance the bike. You've got customers here in the thousands that will become customers for life. It's the obvious thing to do, right? They had the money, they had the clientele. Now let's just turn them into lifelong customers. Nah. Whilst people were still waiting for the Leopard, the company decided to do two things. Firstly, they created another bike campaign, the Speed X Unicorn, on both Kickstarter and Indiegogo, which if you ask me, sounds way more painful or pleasurable, depending on the individual, than it has any right to be. As bad as this sounds, it was actually the logical step forward. The Leopard, as hated as it was in its reviews, did actually have some hardcore fans. So with that in mind, the Unicorn was going to be a massive success, improving yet again on everything. The campaign gained $636,683 on Kickstarter and a further $674,263 over on Indiegogo, with the end result being nothing just like the mythical creature that it's based on. Besides units showing up on trade shows and in the campaign video, the backers never actually saw these things in person. But would you believe it? This still isn't the interesting part of this story. To recap, the company had millions and millions in the bank, off the back of five campaigns and private investors, and they had millions and millions of users' information too, either via the campaigns or the application. And don't forget, the company also has a very successful Android button business that they had built up and sold for a neat, tidy profit. From the outside looking in, you would be a fool not to trust them and invest in any of their future endeavors. Which is why before the announcement of the Unicorn, they went ahead and did something else. They started a brand new business. And that business was Blue Go Go. 
You see, Li Gang had noticed something, and that something was the bike share business. During this time, the bike share business was booming, and it was booming hard. For those that don't know, the bike share model is exactly what it says on the tin. Instead of dealing with all of the issues of owning and looking after a bike, you can rent, um, sorry, you can share one. You simply tap your card and off you go on a pretty standard bike helping you get around the city quicker healthier and easier than ever before dropping off the bike pretty much anywhere and then grabbing a different one for your journey home in the uk we have the boris bikes which definitely do exist i've seen the odd person use them around london but it's in china where the whole bike share thing really did take off Starting in 2005, only two years later, two of the biggest names in the field were valued at $4 billion, and that figure would have been even higher if it wasn't for loads of smaller companies trying to jump onto the bandwagon. The only problem was, they didn't have the capital to compete. But Speedex did, and that's how we ended up with Blue Go Go. Blue GoGo -Go was yet another company created by Lai Gang pumping out these blue rental bikes like no one's business in the overcrowded bike share space. And if you're thinking to yourself that there's no way a company this small could compete with these big boys, you're wrong. In order to compete, the company was churning out bikes left, right and centre. We're talking 10,000 bikes a day. And they'd even started to move overseas within mere months of operation. They had no choice but to go crazy with production like this. Everyone else was doing it. More and more companies got involved and everyone was just churning them out so quickly that weirdly, it was actually putting bike shops out of business. You didn't need to own your own one anymore. These things were literally everywhere. At the height of Blue GoGo's bike share business, the company had 800,000 bikes in circulation, putting them in third place behind the already established yellow Ofo bikes and silver Mobike bikes. Blue Go was spending money like no one's business, way more than the crowdfunding attempts raised, that's for sure, and they were able to do all of this thanks yet again to outside investors who were more than happy to help the company grow into some genuine competition against the yellows and the silvers. They did what they could to make sure that as many of these bikes you saw around Beijing and neighboring cities were blue. But they didn't stop there. One of the other ways they wanted to take on the competition was by gamifying the entire experience. And yes, this is how it all went tits up. Now, I'm not exactly sure what kind of game they were creating here, but the 20 million active users that use these bikes had the ability to change their markers to tanks. Regardless of the type of game it was, that doesn't really matter to the story. What does matter is the image you see on the screen, which some random Blue Go Go user had uploaded to social media, and boy oh boy was it causing some serious outrage. But why? It's just a tank game, right? You're not telling me this is yet another example of people complaining about censorship in video games, right? <sighs> if only. You see, these screenshots of the Bike Share game app went up on June the 4th, 2017, and the location of these um, tanks was Chang'an Avenue, which was the road leading to Tiananmen Square. And that name alone had probably raised alarm bells to the big problem here. Now, if you go to Google and you search for Tiananmen Square in the Western world, all you're going to be seeing is references to the 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre, which came about after protests were held at this location, resulting in the Chinese government cracking down, sending in the military, killing several hundreds or possibly even several thousand people in the process. A terrible day in history that is now often referred to as the Tiananmen Square massacre or the June 4th massacre. And only one day later, on June 5th, on the same stretch of road, one of the most iconic pieces of footage to ever come from this event bears an incredibly striking similarity to this uploaded image. Accident? Or one of the most hardcore marketing stunts ever? You decide. 
Honestly, whatever opinion you have on this, the results are the same. Because after all of this, the company was devastated with bad press resulting in no more money being injected into the business, completely killing any hope that they had of becoming number two or possibly even number one. This of course had a knock-on effect too with the Kickstarter as the unicorn bike never saw the light of day and a whole heap of the unfulfilled orders of course never being fulfilled for the other campaigns too. Now, this wasn't the only reason that the company collapsed. The Chinese government's attempt to regulate the ridiculous boom that was the bike sharing industry ended up killing loads of companies similar to this and, as a result, created probably the most colourful scrap heap you will ever see in your life. A company that was worth over $150 million and had over 500 employees died in less than six months after this screenshot was shown online, leaving many disgruntled employees claiming that Lai Gang ran away as quickly as he could after these events with the remaining money for himself. But of course, remember guys, these are disgruntled employees, so you can come to your own conclusion regarding that one. Hey there guys, thanks for checking out the video. I apologize that my voice was a little bit uh, broken in this video. I lost it earlier on in the week, it's a lot better now. <laughs> uh, but I'm being quiet right now because the entire house is asleep, so I've got to be super, super quiet. But hey, this is the part of the video I would like to give a massive thank you to all of you people. Thank you so, so much for your support. I can't thank you enough. With an extra big shout out going to the following Patreons and YouTube members, which you guys can, of course, become part of as well by checking out the links down below. Let's give these big shout outs, shall we? <laughs> to Aaron Gorman, Akatimo84, Andrew Dalton, Arista, Benjamin Guy, Big Rico, uh, Boots and Pup, Brand. Perez, Chef Matic, Chris the Shapeshifter, uh, Christopher Devero, Clan Bob, Conrad Constantine, De Action Saxon, Dina, Dina81, Game Apologist, Gary Pinkett, Ian Quell, Intrigued Gaming, Atalki Teacher, The Ashen Knight, Jay is Manchild, Jabba Al Aiden, James, Jeff Mianowski, Jeremy Bauer, Jeremy Rodriguez, uh, sorry, uh, uh, King Link Reviews, King of Carrot Flower, Lucas Softel, Man Shovel, Matt Jackson, Michael Ridley Dash, Mike Fallon, Mind of the Unsane, Nicholas Burtner, Nick Pollard, Over Jarl Zane, Roll VP, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, Richard Aldergic, Roven Army, Sir Nielsen, Shade Silent, Shadow Dragon, Solix Captor, Taylor Rainwater, That Gamer, The Cunning Linguist, The Sneaky Ferret, Tim Lunn, Todd Paul Float G, Vetus Varness, Vike Echoes, What Was Been, The Wonder Ducks, and Ye Old Hamburglar. Like I said, guys, thank you all so, 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 so much. It is super late here in the UK when I'm getting this video sorted to get it public for you guys. Regardless, thank you all so, so much for your support. I can't thank you enough. Please do hit that subscribe button, um, give it a thumbs up, comment, do all of that stuff. You know what you're doing. But until next time, guys, this is DJ Soap signing out, and hopefully I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.